to linger on the little thread that you started pulling on this man, Genghis Khan, that was a leader. Temujin, yeah. What do you think makes a great leader? Maybe if you have other examples throughout history. And great, again, let's lose that ter- use that term loosely. Yeah, I was going to ask for a definition. Great uniter of whether it's evil or good, it doesn't matter. Is there somebody who stands out to you, Alexander the Great, so we're talking about military or ideologies, you know, some people bring up FDR or, or I mean, it could be the founding fathers of this country, or we can go to, uh, was he man, uh, man of the century up there, Hitler of uh, the 20th century? And Stalin and these people had really uh, amassed the amount of power that probably has never been seen in the history of the world. Is there somebody who stands out to you by way of uh, trying to define what makes a great uniter, great leader in one man or a woman maybe in the future? It's an interesting question. And one I've thought a lot about because, well, let's take Alexander the Great as an example, because Alexander fascinated the world of his time, fascinated ever since people have been fascinated with the guy. But Alexander was a hereditary monarch, right? Yeah. He he was handed the kingdom. Which he is did, fascinating. Right. But he did not need to rise from nothing yeah. to get that job. In fact, he reminds me of a lot of other leaders, of Frederick the Great, for example, in Prussia. These are people who inherited the greatest army of their day. Alexander, unless he was an imbecile, was going to be great no matter what, because, I mean, if you inherit the Wehrmacht, (laughs) you're going to be able to do something with it, right? Uh, Alexander's father may have been greater, Philip. uh, Philip II was the guy who who literally did create uh, a, a, a strong kingdom from a disjointed group of people that were continually beset by their neighbors. He's the one that reformed that army, uh, took things that he had learned from other uh, Greek leaders like the Theban leader at Pamenondas, um, and and then laboriously over his lifetime stabilized the frontiers, built this system. He lost an eye doing it. He, 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 his leg was made lame. I mean, he, this was a man who looked like he built the empire and led from from the front ranks. I mean, um, so, and then, and then who may have been killed by his son, we don't know who assassinated Philip, um, but then handed the greatest army the world had ever seen to his son, who then did great things with it. Uh, you see this, this pattern many times. So in my mind, I'm not sure Alexander really can be that great when you compare him to people who arose from nothing. So the difference between what we would call in the United States, the self-made man or the one who inherits a fortune. Uh, there's an old line that, you know, uh, it's, it's a slur, but uh, it's about rich people. And it's, it's like he was born on he was born on third base and thought he hit a triple, right? Yeah. Um, Philip was born at home plate and he had to hit. Alexander started on third base. And so I try to draw a distinction uh, between them. Genghis Khan is tough because there's two traditions. The tradition that we grew up with here in the United States and that I grew up learning was that he was a self-made man. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there is a tradition, and it may be one of those things that's put after the fact because a, lo- a long time ago, whether or not you had blue blood in your veins was an important distinction. Mm-hmm. And so the distinction that you'll often hear from Mongolian history uh, is that this was a, a nobleman who had been deprived of hmm. his inheritance, so he was a blue blood anyway. I don't know which is true. Uh, there's certainly, I mean, when you look at a Genghis Khan, though, you have to go, that is a wicked amount of uh, of things to have achieved. Uh, he's very impressive as a figure. Attila is very impressive as a figure. Um, Hitler's an interesting figure. He's one of those people. Cause, you know, the more you study about Hitler, the more you wonder where the defining moment was. Because um, if you look at his life, I mean, Hitler was a relatively common soldier in the First World War. I mean, he, he was brave. He got. Uh, He got some decorations. In fact, the highest decoration he got in the First World War was given to him by a Jewish officer. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, he often didn't talk about that decoration, even though it was the more prestigious one because Mm -hmm. it would open up a whole can of worms you didn't want to get into. Mm -hmm. But Hitler's, I mean, if you said, who was Hitler today? One of the top things you're going to say is he was an anti-Semite. Well, then you have to draw a distinction between 
general regular anti-Semitism that was pretty common in the era and something that was a rabid level of anti-Semitism. But Hitler didn't seem to show a rabid level of, of anti-Semitism until after or at the very end of the First World War. So if this is a defining part of this person's character and, and much of what we consider to be his, his evil stems from that, what happened to this guy when he's an adult, right? He's already fought in the war to change him so. I mean, it's almost like the old, there was always a movie theme. Somebody gets hit by by something on the head and their whole personality changes, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it almost seems something like that. So I don't think I call that necessarily a great leader. It, to me, the interesting thing about Hitler is what the hell happened to a nondescript person who didn't really impress anybody mm-hmm. with his skills? And then in, in the 1920s, is all of a sudden, as you said, sort of the man of the hour, right? Yeah. So that to me is kind of fast. I have this feeling that Genghis Khan, and we don't really know, was an impressive human being from the get-go. And then he was raised in this environment with pressure on all sides. So you you start with this diamond and then you polish it and you harden it his whole life. Hitler seems to be a very unimpressive gemstone most of his life. And then all of a sudden, so I mean, I don't think I can label great leaders. And, and, And I'm always fascinated by that idea that uh, and I'm, tr- I'm trying to remember who the quote was by that that great men, oh, Lord Acton. So great men are often not good men. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. that in order to be great, you would have to jettison many of the moral qualities that we normally would consider a Jesus or a Gandhi or, you know, the, the Martin, I mean, the, these these qualities that one looks at as, as the good upstanding moral qualities that we should all aspire to as examples, right? The Buddha, whatever it <laughs> might be. Um, those people wouldn't make good leaders because what you need to be a good leader often requires the kind of choices that a true philosophical Diogenes moral man wouldn't make. Yeah. Um, so I don't have an answer to your question. How about that? That's a very <laughs> long way of saying, I don't know. Just to linger a little bit, it does feel like from my study of Hitler that the time molded the man versus Genghis Khan where it feels like he, the man molded his time. Yes. And I feel that way about a lot of those nomadic uh, Confederacy builders, that they really seem to be these figures that that stand out as extraordinary for one in, in one way or another. And remembering, by the way, that almost all the history of them were written by the enemies that they so mistreated that they were probably never going to get any good press. They didn't write that's, themselves. That's a caveat we should always yes. add to basically all Nomadic or Native American peoples or tribal peoples anywhere generally do not get the advantage of being able to write the history of their heroes.